Good evening. Welcome to the May 11th, two, uh, 2021 regular meeting of the Wyndham Southeast School District Board. Uh, the meeting has been properly warned and uh, there are no, no real big changes to the <clears throat> agenda other than that we do have uh, three additional new hires to add to the consent agenda. And so I will do that when we move the consent agenda. Um, as many of, as many or most of you know, um, last week was Teacher Appreciation Week, and um, we didn't meet during Teacher Appreciation Week, which probably some teachers appreciated. But uh, I didn't want to let it go by. And actually, Tim Maciel uh, and Andy the Karzinski reminded me uh, that we we didn't want to let it go by. So I asked Tim Maciel, who is um, has a lot of experience leading uh, complex organizations and supporting and uh, inspiring people. So I asked him to uh, write a proclamation and, um, and read it uh, in recognition of the work of our staff and all the time, but particularly in this uh, astonishingly difficult year. So okay. uh, <clears throat> this are is you ready your proclamation than the last one. Okay, proclamation. In celebration of Teacher Appreciation Week, the WSESD School Board takes great pleasure in recognizing the extraordinary achievements of our teaching staff. By any metric used, Vermont public schools traditionally rank among the best in the nation, and the schools in the WSESD are clear, clearly no exception. More than any other factor, we enjoy the success mainly because of an exceptionally talented and dedicated teaching staff. Long before a pandemic upended our lives, we could always depend on our staff to provide quality education to each and every student in our district. But during this past year, they have been nothing less than the superheroes of Southern Vermont who quickly met the monumental challenge of adjusting their skills to remote learning and outdoor learning environments and who worked tirelessly for each and every student in their charge. When in-person classes resumed, our staff risked their own health and welfare for the benefit of the students for whom they care so deeply. Today and every day, we thank them for their patience, their compassion, their resilience, and their indomitable spirit. And we thank them for building confidence in our students' ability to learn at their highest levels and to see the world in different ways. We thank them for teaching our students to recognize the beauty in the world and for, for promoting the core values that are so essential for personal and professional success in today's society. We thank them for being the good people they are. It has become almost a cliche to say that our future depends on how, how well our students are prepared in school, but it is true and worth repeating. The kind, curious and creative souls be nurtured by our staff today will be the ones who shape society tomorrow. And this is why education is so very important. And so the WSESD board expresses its heartfelt gratitude to the staff with assurances that we will continue to support them in their good work in every way we can. Thank you, Tim. That was terrific. And I'm going to see if we can get that uh, published in the local media as well. Um, we have a couple of uh, guests this week. Um, the first one, Chloe Leary from the Winston, po Winston Prouty Center. I, I invited Co Chloe to come because of uh, an article I read about the uh, potential, um, uh, oh, I'll let her explain what's happening with Children's Integrated Services. I just want to say that 10 or more years ago when the Brattleboro Town School Board was trying to figure out how to help families get the services that they were entitled to and desperately needed like food and dental care and shelter. And um, it was a very difficult process. You had to go to different offices at different times of day. It was very complex paperwork that had to be, had to be figured out. And we realized that we had we were going to have to hire people, social workers, to do that work because it just it wasn't happening and it was really crucial. And so we did start hiring social workers, and that continues to this day. But um, 
somewhere along the line, the chair of the board at that time, Margaret Atkinson, uh, while we were talking about this phenomenon of being so difficult for services to be um, accessed in a, in a relatively simple way, she told me that that's actually what Chloe Leary's been doing at Winston Prouty Center for a long time. So I wanted to recognize her for that, but especially I wanted to have her come and talk about the importance of children's integrated services and um, and if she may have some ideas about how we can help since the work that she does and that Cassandra Holloway, who we'll hear from uh, when Chloe's finished, both do to, um, to get to, to, to work with our kids to get them ready for school or while they're in school to help them be successful. So these are people that are, they don't work in our district, but they certainly work with our kids. So Chloe, um, I don't know if you need to share the screen, but I can enable that. And um, you feel free to just go ahead. Great, um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Big formal presentation, um, but I'm happy to send materials um, and, and anything that anybody's interested in. So thanks so much for the opportunity to talk with you all. And David, thanks for reaching out. And Tim, as you were reading that um, proclamation, what came to mind for me is how important it is that whole continuum you know, for us to recognize that really school readiness is happening in pre-K and early ed and infant toddler programs too. And so I think any chance we get to talk about the continuum and how we are all connected um, is really important. So thanks for that opportunity. So some of you may have seen my commentary last week in the reformer and, and VT Digger about the power of integrated services. And I think some of you experience this too um, with social workers in your schools that the more we can wrap around families and support them, the better off that they are and the better outcomes we get. So children's integrated services, the state of Vermont um, figured out a way to fund services for families with young children prenatal to age six. And that set of services in our community happens through Winston Prouty. A lot of people think that we are just an early learning center. Some people still think that we are only an early learning center for children with special needs. So if you think that, please call me so I can tell you more about the whole set of community-based services. And we actually touch many more families that way. I, you know, between sort of childcare referral and different services that are light touch to more intensive services, we touch probably over 600 families in our community. That doesn't even include the bookmobile, the Early Learning Express. So we touch a lot of children and families, um, and a, a lot of those are through Children's Integrated Services. So that includes nursing, so prenatal and postpartum support. That includes early childhood family mental health and partnership with HDRS. It includes early intervention, which is special education for the zero to three set, in case you part C of the individual, the IDEA. Um, family support, so sort of general social work and support for families, um, and then specialized child care. So children who are in child care who are in protective services or have some other special need. So that team is an interdisciplinary team that works with a bunch of families in our community. And the only criteria is you have to have a kid between either be uh, pregnant or have a child in the family um, six or under, and we can work with that family. And again, a lot of people don't know that there's no, it is a Medicaid funded program, but we are actually able to help uh, lots of different families. Early intervention is open to anybody um, that it's a federal entitlement. So um, we can work with all the families with young children in our communities. And if we can't help them, we will figure out where they need to go. So um, I like to, you know, I know that you all are aware of early education services. That is the parent child center in our community. They are a great resource. Um, and we also have the same, no wrong door, let us know what you need, we'll help you get connected. So all the staff in schools, I hope, are aware of that. And um, I think, again, it's a really unknown um, sort of service in our community and all the communities in Vermont. So what is going on right now that I think it would be great for folks on this call to be aware of is that the current administration would like to dismantle the Child Development Division, which includes Children's Integrated Services. And what that would do is take apart, it would put child care functions in AOE and Part C in, in the Agency of Education. It would move other home visiting to the Vermont Department of Health and then leave some um, functionality in economic services in the Department of Children and Families. It would just split it up. So 
that just would not serve kids and families well, and frankly, it wouldn't serve all the partner community, you know, the, the partners that we work with. It, it, I, I think it would actually really diminish how we are able to help kids get ready for school, frankly. We, um, you know, we work a lot in early childhood in lots of different ways. And so I think if that happened, we would be, the, the impact on our community would be more kids not ready for school, more kids needing special education, and more families sort of struggling and not able to support their kids and their child's wow. development. So I think it's a direct impact um, all the way up the continuum. And the more, you know, if there is a, the bill that supported that effort did not go anywhere this session, but I, I don't, um, there are other ways to dismantle division. So I'm gonna keep on it. And I, I just ask that you stay aware of it because it is a really vital service in our community. Um, so, you know, I don't, I know you have a big meeting and lots of big agenda, but I just uh, thank you for letting me speak to this issue a little bit and for being aware that Winston Prouty is, you know, um, here, here to help young kids and families and here to collaborate, frankly, with lots of different people. Actually, I think I see Mary Kaufman on the call and during the pandemic last um, spring, it was great to work with her on childcare in our community and essential child worker childcare and you know, I think the more we can collaborate as a community, the stronger we will be, and we are certainly here to be doing that. So, um, so yeah, David, I don't know if that was sort of what you were hoping I would cover. I'm certainly open to questions, and I, you know, my WinstonProudy.org, and it's Chloe at WinstonProudy.org, and I am more than um, open to hearing from folks and getting questions. So, yep. thanks, Chloe. That's exactly what I wanted. You know, we it's. Um, we're all board members and we know things about things, but we, you know, we don't really know an awful lot about preschool and early education. And we're certainly not in, in the middle of it, doing the work and, and doing it as long as effectively as you have been. So I wanted to get, have your voice and, and I hope you'll continue to keep us surprised of, of developments as they happen. Are there any questions from the board for Chloe? Yeah, Liz. Um, yeah, Chloe. Um, Liz Adams. Um, is there anything we could do to support you? Oh, thank you, Liz, for asking. I, um, I think staying aware of the issue and the value of, of, of what we're doing and understanding that early childhood is a system um, and just having that knowledge will be helpful as we sort of wait to see what the administration does. You know, I think that... Um, and just to, to stay aware of early childhood as a, you know, how we interface and connect um, and, and as a school board, understanding that I know you have a primary function of dealing with public education K through 12, and there's this other piece. And I think I see Mariah on the call. Um, Mariah Carney sort of sits here and helps keep you apprised of pre-K. Um, but I, it, right now, I think the awareness and if there is advocacy to be done, I will certainly let you know. So thank you for okay. that question, Liz. Yeah, keep me in keep. Um, I, I'm a retired early um, childhood teacher. Great. Um, my daughter had worked um, for CIS, so I've been trying to stay on top of it, but anything I can do, please let me know. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Jackie. Thanks, David, and thank you, Chloe. I was actually gonna ask the same thing um, that Liz asked. I know, I know. Um, but instead of asking that, I'll just make a quick comment. One other thing that I just happen to have knowledge of that would be good for everyone to know is that, uh, you know, Children's Integrated Services all throughout this year has also done a really amazing job of pivoting their strategies. We've switched child care centers and our early intervention person has just followed Annabelle wherever she needed to go. And that included doing a lot of it through Zoom and just like the dedication and flexibility was so amazing for us. It was so amazing. So since you're here, Chloe, I just want to say thanks and let everybody know that. And Thank you. That's great to hear. <laughs> Talk about multitasking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions or, uh, from the public or the administration for Chloe? Well, thank you again for coming. And, and I hope we won't hear from you. And <laughs> we won't need to. <laughs> I hope so. But great. Yeah, Thanks, great. Thank you so much. Great. And. Um, so our second communication is um, Cassandra Holloway from BPAC uh, to talk about, well, actually quite a lot. So um, Cassandra, again, you you can, uh, I think you are able to scare, uh, share the screen. So uh, just go right ahead. Okay. 
Thank you. So I, yes, so I'm Cassandra. I'm the director of Building a Positive Community. Um, and I also have with me Jack Clark, who has been our youth program coordinator, and she'll be uh, sharing this presentation with me. Great. And I also wanted to acknowledge Diana Wally, who um, had co-created the uh, social competency development work uh, with Ron Staley, I don't know, almost a decade ago, uh, kind of coming off of the Search Institute's youth asset development work that was happening in the state and the school district. So um, we have been working with Diana Wally for about five years now um, in partnership. And uh, as Diana's um, taking, uh, stepping back from some of those responsibilities, we've been able to contract with the school district to, to, to do that work um, that she has been doing. Uh, this year was supposed to be like kind of the transition year and she was going to be there to, to just kind of support us through uh, us taking on her previous responsibilities. But as most of you have been experiencing, we also have had to adapt quite a bit um, to meet the needs of, of our, the students and the school staff. So uh, we're looking forward to sharing just how we have adapted. I also want to say that one of the other things Diana did, uh, my dog's tail is, is hitting my computer. So I'm sorry if it's moving. <laughs> um, I'll zoom. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to also just acknowledge Tom Yon. Uh, um, Diana brought Tom in this year and I, you know we, we were so grateful, but even more so now. Um, having lost him, um, but I just want to, you'll see um, that we share a lot of the same philosophies of Tom. Um, so it was just a beautiful um, connection that we were able to make. And he had a lot to do with what you'll be hearing about today. So I just wanted to uh, have him in this space as well for us. So I can start the presentation. <clears throat> okay, so well, the thing is, is I gotta figure out how to move it. Um, when you're, does anybody have any ideas of how to, Get it to go to the next screen when you're sharing. Anyone? <laughs> Hopefully, let's see. Um, I'm sorry. It works until, let me try to stop it and share it one more time. I don't know if anybody's ever used Canva on here before and um, oh, I guess it was doing it. On me. Ah, okay, here we go. <clears throat> so uh, hopefully it will move as I talk. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was we usually do a training in January and uh, with our middle school leadership teams and Landmark College. And uh, we weren't able to do that this year. Uh, so one of the things we decided to do was to do a virtual community fair uh, called Do the Thing. And that was for all students at uh, grades uh, six through eighth. And it was finding ways that um, to connect the things that they love with current opportunities that were happening in the community, or to also give them the idea that they can actually create their own opportunities for themselves and their peers. We had about 40 students um, enroll and to uh, uh, register to be part of this, uh, which we had a short period of time for them to register. So we're actually very excited about that. Um, as you can see from here, we had a, quite an eclectic group of presenters. Um, Ann Braden was a keynote speaker with uh, student Alex Ethier, who she's at Green Street um, School. And they talked about the Love uh, Letter Brigade and the Flight of the Puffin, which is the new book out. Uh, Joe Rivers, who I saw is here. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe and um, Maeve and Allison, two students at BAMS, uh, did just an amazing job presenting about the uh, Brattleboro Historical Society, but also they did a breakout. And we did four breakouts based on uh, interests. Chloe and Lindsay talked about teen opportunities at the Brooks Memorial Library. Uh, Trinity and Z, um, as well as uh, <clears throat> Jillian talked about Youth for Change from the Roots Justice Center. Stephen Dotson and Kevin O'Brien from the town planning committee uh, and Django Grace, who's doing work there with the energy committee, uh, did breakouts for us. And Michelle Simpson, from the director from the Boys and Girls Club, um, find, you know, finished it up with offering free spring memberships to the members, um, to the participants, as well as offering that space for not just their programming, but anything that the youth want to do. So it was a very exciting um, event. And I just wanted to have my son, if he's open to it, come and talk 
Um, so Gavin is at BAMS and he was part of Tom Yon's breakout. And I just wanted to have him speak a little bit to um, how that experience was. Yeah. Um, the, the breakout room that I was in was uh, working with your hands. So we started out with a cool icebreaker, just talking about like human hands and stuff. But then eventually we got to um, uh, thinking that the middle schoolers should have an opportunity working at the career center. I don't know if that's possible or have been brought up before, but uh, we just thought it'd be really cool. And then also we thought it would be cool if they could uh, watch, uh, I'm pretty sure there's like STEM presentations there and we thought it would be really cool if they could watch that. And altogether the event was really cool. It was just really cool to see like what was going on in the community. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Gavin. Um, so here's some other comments that we had uh, from the youth that participated when we asked them what they were, you know, what they got, what they found most exciting about the presentation. So I'm just gonna take a second so you can look at um, just some of the things that they shared. <laughs> as you can see, they, they were really excited to get a chance to meet each other and find out what was available to them. Um, and, um, and it was, you know, it was three hours on Zoom. So I just wanna like say that that's a long time and they stuck with it, a majority of them stuck with it. We're gonna do this twice a year. I think we're for shorter time and less presenters. It was a lot to take in, um, more breakouts. We didn't know if they'd wanna talk with each other but they actually wanted to talk to each other more than we had time for them. So that's something we'll make sure we have more time for and involving them in the planning of it. We have a copenconnect.org resource guide that we created for teens in the beginning of the year um, that we are gonna have the community opportunities in. So if anybody knows of any community opportunities for teens, please um, let me know and we can get that into that guide. We did let the students know about that. About 90% of the kids said they wanted to work with their hands, that they loved working with their hands. That wasn't something we had expected. So we wanna make sure that that's part of our future trainings or, or events and um, keeping in, them engaged. So we have an email list now, um, letting them know about opportunities and events. And then we ourselves are looking at how do we you know, connect this to individual learning plans and school credits later on. So that's our future steps with the do the thing. So it will be something we plan to actually, we did it in lieu of the January training, but we hope to continue using that. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna let Jack go into the next part. Thank you, Cassandra. So something that, that also usually happens uh, throughout all of the schools uh, in the, the, all the elementary schools and middle schools is having the middle school leadership teams meeting on a regular basis. And during COVID, some of them have continued to meet and one of the things that was requested both during COVID and even prior to COVID from the advisors was having some kind of guide that had activities that were accessible for both in-person and uh, virtual meetings. So something that would uh, give them the context for what, what is it that this is about? What is the history? and resources for different topics that come up on a regular basis in the meeting so that they're not having to constantly search because there is not a set curriculum. And while there, there is an example of a curriculum that could be completely virtually offered uh, around inclusion and kindness that was developed uh, as a summer camp offering, a virtual summer camp offering that we did last year uh, with one of our college interns, uh, these, this is really more to offer some a, a bit of resources for those who want more and inspiration for those who are really more their own designers, but they'd like to have some references, maybe uh, an occasional activity, and also as something that they can add to as they continue to learn and share both with their students and on their own. Uh, this is designed as a Google Drive. So it is uh, going to be uh, very accessible for adding to uh, altering and growing throughout the years. And that's that's most of what I wanna say on that. Thank you. So um, that leads us to the middle school leadership training. We are gonna be able to do it this year, which we're very excited about. Usually we have about um, 90 students, I think, um, and going to that um, in their students that are gonna be rising as sixth graders through eighth graders, we do it at Landmark, we've done it at SIT in the past, um, and it kind of gets them ready to go into the next school year. We usually use the, um, we always use the school climate survey as something 
to um, kind of sink their teeth into um, that's geared towards their specific school. We get those ready for them. And um, that won't be the case this year because that was not a school climate survey, but we are looking forward to hopefully getting some information from the Panorama Social and Emotional Learning Survey that we can use for this particular training. We're very fortunate to be able to partner with Vermont After School. There's a um, person named Matt Wolf who does very similar trainings um, and is gonna be working alongside us. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we have our first meeting this week. Um, and what we really wanted, to, because there hasn't been, as Jack mentioned, all the schools haven't really had um, full like asset leadership teams for this year, is we wanted to see if there's any youth, um, two maybe two to three youth per school that, that really have um, skills to be able to co-facilitate or even facilitate meetings, but maybe need to hone their skills as facilitators. Um, so that will be what the training will be for. It'll be a lot smaller, between 25 to 30 students. Um, and they're going to be learning just how to co-host and lead these activities using the guide that Jack mentioned and other resources. Um, and also making sure that their group is diverse and, uh, you know, inclusive and equitable. So really being responsible to the holding the safe space for the other students, um, the other team members. And also understanding the breadth of what leadership is, that it's not always somebody who's very vocal and, and action oriented, that there's a lot of different uh, ways that people can be leaders um, and even stretching their own understanding of who they are as leaders. So that will be the purpose of the training for this, for this uh, April 3rd training. And I um, just wanna make sure, and I'm really also wanted to say that I'm excited for Andy, cause I know he's had quite a year to be able to have this, um, usually the superintendent has been always involved um, towards some of the design aspects, definitely having input, but always there to welcome the students and to um, be there with the students. And I think it's just such a rewarding, uh, just to see the superintendent's beam. Um, and usually we do parent dinners, we're not gonna be able to do that this year, but um, it's just a lovely experience for the superintendents and for the kids to, uh, the students to be able to, to meet them. And um, so we're really looking forward to that training. Jack? Absolutely. And something that has been able to happen uh, quite robustly during COVID times that we even initiated during uh, the pandemic is the quality youth development certification process for Brattleboro. And this, this has been a, a steering committee formed of 50% youth and adults um, pretty much our whole time. Uh, to work towards seven out of 10 benchmarks that really show Brattleboro's commitment for having a community that is supporting an environment for youth to thrive. And so far we have attained three of the seven benchmarks needed thus far. We're, we're getting ready to really push out that, that celebration of these three benchmarks that we've attained, which is really wonderful. And uh, if we could move to the, actually to the next slide that has a little bit of detail about those, those benchmarks. Um, there it is. Um, so the fir first being that we have a safe space in Brattleboro for all youth that is accessible no matter how, how what income level they are at. And that uh, work, that research work was done by one of our youth interns who established a relationship and communication with Michelle Simpson at the Boys and Girls Club and really initiated that research. Uh, another benchmark we have is the funding by our community, the town's commitment for funding youth programs based on our population and uh, the families uh, who would qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, we, we calculated all kinds of what do we have, how many youth, and needing to spend at least $25 per young person in our community. And uh, again, one of our interns and one of our adult steering committee members, uh, Andrew Graminski, they crunched the numbers compared. And we, in fact, we have $30 per young person that we spend as a community, which is really wonderful. Uh, another one that we were able to attain uh, was that we do in fact have a professional youth mentoring program within the community that serves uh, a really solid number of youth who are in the most need uh, of having a mentor. And professional youth mentoring means that it is uh, a mentoring program that follows the standards set by a mentor, which is uh, in that 
field, it is the go-to professional organization that sets all of the, the guidelines for um, how, how they should be conducting themselves and conducting trainers of mentors. And what we're moving towards next is an elected community youth council. And Cassandra is gonna talk a little bit more about that. Coming soon. So we have applied for funding through the Vermont Children's Trust Fund. It's not a big grant. So if we aren't able to get it, then we think we could get funding elsewhere. We have about $10,000. Most of that is actually going to stipends to pay youth to help to design the youth council. And we are basing it on the process that the Vermont after school used with um, 50 students is how many they picked, uh, or 50 youth, sorry, not students, um, to develop what they thought would be best uh, youth council. And they kind of answered questions and broke off into groups. And my son was part of that as well. So I just wanted him to share his experience one more time. <clears throat> um, yeah, it was really cool um, because I was able to like share my point of view on things. Um, and it was also just really uh, nice to be able to design a youth council. It was really a unique, unique experience. And uh, I, think, I think it's great, yeah. Um, so basically we're going to be working with Vermont After School to help that. And if we are able to get this funding or whatever, when we get the funding, we'll also train these youth. I think a big piece to it is um, about civic engagement and for, you know, informing them about civic engagement um, and so part of what I wanted to say is this upcoming year is going to not be the, the, the youth council won't exist in the fall until probably the latter part of the school year, that most of it will be about 20 students or so developing what the youth council will be. They are elected. So, um, part of that will be designing the election process. Um, and then we'll have elected youth to be in the council and that youth council will be there reciprocally for the, um, community leaders. So school board select board. Um, we've been talking with the United Way about their planning. So any group that um, wants to, or board that wants to talk to the youth council, um, collaborate with the youth council and vice versa. If the youth council have concerns or opportunities they want to bring to you all, that will happen. So I really encourage you all to not just be informed, but engaged in that and be champions and to connect with youth as we go through that process. Um, and I think I'm just going to end it with a motto that we have taken on from Tom Young, that the quickest we turn it over to the students, the better off we are going to be. And that is something we are working and striving towards. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. That was, that was terrific. And another example of how much support this community has gives to its students and how much of it happens outside of the school and the overlaps. The, the ways that, that we connect. Um, I wrote down four different things that I'm gonna to write to you about after the meeting based on the, the ways that we could work together. So Yay. thank, you. <laughs> thank uh, you. Any questions from the board for Cassandra? I remember uh, the um, this used to be the BAPC was the Brattleboro Area Prevention Coalition. Mm -hmm. It's uh, building up, a, a, oh, I lost track of it again. I can't keep it yeah, straight. Yeah, it's Brattleboro Area Prevention Coalition. Now it's building a positive community. So we're able to keep the same acronym because we didn't have money for rebranding. Right. <laughs> it, worked out, it worked out for us. Um, and, expanded yeah. concept though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really are focusing more on the youth asset development and also development of relationships. So um, it's just how, those protective factors, really focusing on what we can do as a community to increase the protective factors. Um, but we still do the, you know, address uh, substance abuse prevention work. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? You well, the, or from the administration or <laughs> the public, anyone would uh, have any questions about the work or the projects or wanna know how to contact Cassandra so you can help out? <laughs> yeah, so um, it's, it's going to just be APC802 is uh, probably the easiest way. Uh, you can also find a, our website is BAPC802 at gmail.com. Um, um, uh, .org. My gosh, I'm giving the wrong contact. <laughs> but you have me anyway, I think, because I think there was some forwarding. So okay. you'll find me. And you're also, I've seen, I, I, I believe you're also on our Middle School Leadership Council. 
Yes, and that's been really exciting. And it's been, um, that's a whole nother effort of how to get parents involved in this as well, because that's a whole other group uh, that, you know, I think can support the schools. I, you know, I think it's really important right now that you're all not just doing it on your own, um, that you call in the troops, because uh, we're all here for the kids. Well, the, the, the policy includes students where appropriate, and it seems like middle schools definitely are appropriate. And I can think of one uh, candidate. Yeah. Oh. There's, yeah, there's actually a big, uh, there's been this little buzz. I think we've been focusing on other stuff, but there's been this little like undercurrent of um, getting youth more involved in, the, in those, um, those councils as well. So I think we're, or those committees. So I think we'll be getting there. Um, and I hopefully that's another thing with the leadership is giving more opportunities uh, because it's not always, they're not going to always want to do one thing, right? So more eclectic opportunities for these kids is a big piece. Thank you for bringing that up, David. Yeah. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, so I think we'll, um, I'm going to stay on this, um, this tone and skip the consent agenda for now and, and move to the, um, administrative report where you have a, pre a presentation from the uh, the middle school, conveniently enough, uh, this evening. So I see Keith is here. Um, are you the MC for this, Keith, or is your staff just going to take you take it over? Well, I'm going to, um, thank you, David. I'm going to do a quick introduction and say a, a few words, and then I'm going to turn it over to my staff. I have four wonderful teachers here. David, while I'm speaking or whoever um, has control over the meeting, could you give uh, Tom the Shaka screen sharing abilities, yes. um, Christy Henderson and Jill Rivers? Yep. And I'm not sure if Liz needs it or not. Yes, and Liz Scanlon as well. They all have different sections they're gonna present. Um, they, can't, they can't all share at the same time, but they, they have access. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple quick things. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join tonight's meeting. It's hard to put into words the experiences we've had this year. Um, there have been incredible challenges, but the positive side of me is happy to say we've made it through all those things successfully. Most of us as adults can't imagine what it would be like to go through what our students have gone through this year. They've had schedule changes, structural changes presented to them on a regular basis. And through it all, um, they've persevered and we're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I cannot be more proud of our staff. Um, just like the students, they have persevered through a ridiculous amount of change. It feels like 10 years of changes in one year. They're pretty tired at this point, but they come in every day with a smile because they know they're serving the kids and their positive presence is the most important thing happening for most kids. Um, I'm proud of the progress we've made during such a uh, hard year. Tonight, you will hear from two hybrid teachers. They've been here four days a week, um, second half of the year. Um, they're from Team Draco in the seventh grade, uh, Tom the Shotgun, and Liz Scanlon. And we will then transition to presentations by our remote team, Team Felix, Christy Henderson and Joe Rivers will be, will be uh, representing um, their team. And uh, we're excited to hear from a few students and they will be introduced by our teachers. I think there's video clips. So um, I'd like to turn things over to Liz and Tom. Thanks so much, Keith. Really appreciate it. And thanks so much to the board for inviting us to talk about BAMS from all of us that are presenting on BAMS. Uh, as Keith said, I'm Tom Nishatka. I'm the instrumental music teacher at BAMS, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk about the hybrid learning environment that we've had this year with my incredible colleague, Liz Scanlon, who teaches English on Team Draco. Um, it's been quite a year, and, and I'll open this with a little anecdote. We had, a, we had our first day of SBACs at BAMS today, so exciting day for us. And then we went outside and engaged in some outdoor activities. And as we were walking in, one of our students looked up at me and said, hey, hey Mr. Nishaka, when's the last day of school? And I looked at him and I said, uh, June 14th, I think for you. So you get about upwards of about five weeks left. And he looked at me and he said, and this echoes what Keith just said. He said, gosh, hasn't this year been the longest six years ever? But God, have we come so far. And it really, I think that just really encapsulates this year. It, it, it seems like it's been an unbelievable challenge, but it, at the same time, it feels like we've come such a long way since those early days of September when we were just kind of trying to figure out how this whole crazy thing was going to work. So on that note, I will share my screen and 
hopefully we're seeing the presentation at this point. Uh, all right, so regarding the structure of the hybrid year that we've had at BAMS, just to give you a little bit of a background about what we've done since the beginning of the year. Um, from the beginning of the year in those early days of September, all the way until January 27th, when that second semester started, students and teachers reported to school for two in-person days each week and engaged in remote learning through the remaining three days. So we had a seventh grade team and an eighth grade team that came in on Mondays and Tuesdays. And the same thing, a seventh grade team and an eighth grade team that came in on Thursdays and Fridays and then taught remotely for the remainder of the other three days. Wednesday, of course, was that half day for students. And it also provided an opportunity and still continues to do so, an opportunity for students to engage with teachers in an office hours environment. So students can go in, get some extra help, get some advice on their schoolwork, kind of one-to-one -one in a way that hasn't been really easy to be able to do, you know, with all the COVID restrictions. Um, so when students and teachers were in person for those two days, and even branching out into the four days into the second semester, students were assigned to an eight to nine person advisory with which they stayed for the remainder of the day. And this was an intentional move so that we could really comply with all the COVID regulations. But what it did for us was it gave us the opportunity to form really strong relationships with our kids and get to know them as learners and as individuals, especially in light of the fact that they were coming back into BAMS after having really their whole world upended in March. So we had to do a lot of planning and a lot of figuring of things out as, as this sort of began. On January 27th, when we switched into the second semester, students and teachers reported to school for four in-person days. And we, of course, remained that, uh, and we maintained that remote day on Wednesdays. The big difference, in which I'll talk about this in a second, the big difference that changed on that um, second semester switch that we had was that exploratory teachers change teams to diversify the offerings for the students. So depending on what team each teacher was assigned to, each student had a different exploratory experience based on that particular staffing. So this team and advisory structure was actually a really interesting thing because it allowed for deep community building within our building. So the teams utilized different social emotional learning practices to engage students in their learning. And I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about some of these things in a second. Uh, the identity unit that our team, Team Draco did, uh, different things about our team town meetings, some things that we did to try to remain and maintain a sense of normalcy in this crazy environment that we had. And of course, the ability to recognize students for their exceptional work. And one of the other great things that we were able to do was utilize our outdoor learning and really utilize um, the different talents that our staff members have in tandem with what we have available to us on our campus to really engage students in a lot of really interesting ways. So, as the school year began, um, different teams of teachers, different staff member combinations got together towards the end of the summer and throughout the summer and decided what they wanted to do to focus on with their students to really give them as much of a sense of normalcy in our, in our, in our new world that we found ourselves in in September. So I'll speak to a little bit on what we did on Team Draco, which was one of the seventh grade teams this year. Uh, we met over the summer and as we sort of hashed through what we wanted to do to give students a sense of belonging, we decided to turn our focus to the concept of identity and belonging. And what we did is we endeavored to create community surrounding the uniqueness of each of our students. We wanted them to be sure that they had a place in our school and a place on our team. But not only that, we wanted to make sure that they could identify specific things about themselves that made them unique and specific things about out them that helped them form their identity. So for the first six weeks of school, our team really embarked on this unit. So we met with our team via Zoom and we talked about different larger concepts of identity. What does it mean to have an identity? What does it mean to create an identity as we grow older? But we also parsed out different aspects of this in our individual classes. So in math, for instance, our math teacher, Peggy Maxfield, did an activity, um, a, a multi-day activity with students called Identity by the Numbers, talking about how students relate to different numbers in their life. In English, Liz, who you'll hear from in a minute, Liz Scanlon talked about different layers of identity, the different ways that a person could identify with their life. In science, we had a really interesting one, the zombie apocalypse survival guide. Were the zombie apocalypse to happen tomorrow, how would you survive? How would you preserve your identity? How would that bring in with the other aspects of identity that we talked about. In social studies, multiple intelligences and different identities in society. In my class, in digital music, we did a project called the Soundtrack to Our Life. 
what is our what is our musical consumerism preferences say about our identity the music that we listen to how does that come together to form a composite with our identity and nancy goodhue in her health class how to be a person how do all the different aspects of health come together to form somebody's identity so we worked on this in an interdisciplinary way for the six weeks and and what i can say and what i've seen come out of this is a really strong bond that we've all been able to form with our students. As they discover who they are in this new world, we've really been able to capitalize on that and have a really tight connection with our kids. And I think that all of our teachers on our team, and I'm sure all of the teachers on the other teams in the school that have embarked on different interdisciplinary units have found very similar things as well. Team town meetings. Now, in a normal non-COVID year, it's a really common activity at BAMS for teams to sit down in our multi-purpose room and have a weekly team meeting come up with some norms and really form their own, again, I'm gonna use, I feel like I've been saying the word identity a lot, but form a team identity is a huge part of our school. But due to distancing regulations, we've done this over Zoom, particularly on our Wednesdays when students are home for their half days. And this has given us a really, a, a really great opportunity to be able to see all of the students at once in our virtual environment, to see students without their masks, which which has really become a treat. It's 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 fun to see students and say, ah, that's what you look like under there. So so that's that's you know something that we never thought we'd have to do is walk around with masks. So it gives us that opportunity. This also this environment has also provided us a method of disseminating important information related to team and school business and just be able to talk to the students all at once and publicly recognize students and exemplify positive qualities that we observe. So if we see something in an in-person day where a student has really, really uh, given a solid example of the way that they can treat other people with empathy and compassion, we can recognize them in front of their peers. And this has been an important hallmark of our work. And it also gives us, of course, an opportunity to have fun with each other by participating in Zoom-based games to continually build that community with these challenging conditions. Um, so going back to our structure, so, Following the April break, so just a couple weeks ago, BAMS engaged in a new structural phrase, allowing students to change pods after their daily advisory period. So if you can imagine the day, the students would come to school in the morning, they would report to their homeroom and their advisory, and then they would switch to a new room with a new group of students and a new teachers. And it really allowed us to get to know a new group of students in person and, and have a new teacher in front of them teaching a different subject and being able to access that teacher's talents, that teacher's core subject area, right while they're in that person's classroom. And it really yielded profound social emotional benefits for our kids. And although it gave our teachers an extra challenge, one of the interesting things that it has done is it really made us all learn each other's content area. I mean, I, I never thought that I, I would learn so much about seventh grade English from Miss Scanlon here, but it's been a really just illuminating experience for me and having to take those concepts of English class as a music teacher myself and to really help facilitate that content to the kids that are in my room. It's, it's been quite an education and I'm, I'm certainly a better teacher for it. And then yesterday, we began another new structure where students changed classrooms during each class period. And this was sort of our holy grail. This has been the thing we've been waiting for all year. The, the return to sort of normalcy, right? So students will report to have reported to their homeroom in the morning starting yesterday, and then they went off and they went to different classrooms with different teachers following every period, just with masks on and, and, and um, recognizing all the distancing regulations that they have had to have. So it's, it's, it was very exciting and it was just a, a really terrific way to, to sort of end out the school year, um, to begin our end of the school year. One more thing that I definitely want to call attention to, another opportunity that we've really taken advantage of at BAMS is our outdoor education. Because we do, as I mentioned earlier, have a lot of really terrific resources on our campus. And this has given us a great way to utilize that campus to physically engage our students in a safe way. It's allowed students to really interact with each other, students that hadn't seen each other all year they can go outside and they can have these outdoor education activities um, and, and interact and create community with some other students that they really hadn't seen throughout the year. And one of the things that impressed me the most was seeing my colleagues' talents as it related to outdoor education. I mean, today, I, another music teacher that I work with, just watching her and her own element in the outdoor education was just really inspiring. It just gives those of us, um, you know, uh, who work with each other an opportunity to really see these new talents that that our other colleagues have with each other. So as you can see, it's been quite an evolution 
this year. It's been quite a ride. And um, I think we're all looking at that light at the end of the tunnel for the end of the year, knowing that we've that we've really traveled a, a, a far distance with each other this year. And it's and I think when we start next year, we're going to start stronger in an interesting way because we've gone through this ride together. So at this point, I'd like to to hand the slideshow presentation over to Liz Scanlon. Um, Liz, did you want me to stop the screen share so you can reshare? Oh, I think you're muted, Liz. <laughs> that's a thing that happens a lot. Oh too. my, you know, that, <laughs> that is, yeah, actually, yeah. That happens so often, <laughs> more often than I want to say. Um, so hi, I'm Liz Scanlon. I teach on Draco with Tom. Um, my slides, you can tell there's definitely two people who did this slideshow. So sorry, mine look a little bit Dr. Seuss-like. Um, so bear with me. I know I was going with that group my daughter looked at them and hated them so I made some changes I don't know whether it's better but um teamwork makes the dream work that was really the hallmark we uh when we started in the summer many of us had gone to the middle grades institute this summer Joe Rivers teaches there and it's fabulous and so we really worked on so social identity and working with kids on identity and when kids came in I guess one thing I want to say is that I had never seen kids that were so grateful to be in school. And that was huge. Um, so as Tom said, you know, we did get familiar with their learning styles. It was, it was very much like being a elementary school classroom teacher, having kids all day, but having middle schoolers can create different problems um, with having them all day. Um, and we were able to provide the content and individualize it. Um, and as Tom said, we needed to learn each other's content quickly. And I'm going to come back to this often because we've had many different structures. So we began the year with in-person and remote days. And then I think it was sometime this winter, Tom, you put it in your presentation that we switched over to being in person totally. But we weren't actually seeing all of our students. So we were in person, but until yesterday, we were Zooming our classes from room to room. So we went from two days where we had remote lessons and we saw the students, just like you're seeing me here when we're seeing each other, when I taught my remote class, I would see all of you. But for the large balance of this year, we've been teaching in person, but because of the COVID regulations, we've needed to stay in a secure pod. So that meant that we had to zoom across rooms. So instead of seeing the kids, we only saw the teachers. And that really, change things and it made it difficult. We did, were able to see kids at other times. Um, we did do large group activities outside, but when we went to teach our classes, I think it's really important that that piece that we had to do another adaptation where we had to adapt it. How do you deliver a lesson when you can't see your learners? Um, so we needed to learn. I needed to learn math. I have to say, I am probably, Peggy Maxwell tells me I'm the best uh, seventh grade math student. And that's saying a lot because I have a lot of residue from my own middle school years um, of, you know, feeling like a bad math student. So I think um, it was amazing. We learned so much from each other. And also students were able to be peer tutors and they really helped each other out. And we were able to do some really cool interdisciplinary work. There were some silver linings for kids. Um, kids formed team and advisories identities. They had kind of that layer of community. So they have a team identity, which they normally have before COVID. 
but they really have this very strong advisory identity that they had not had before you know, in my years of teaching. And we did that through what Tom said, you know, whole team challenges. We have team advisory challenges. We did, we've did. we always done those types of things, but we ramped it up because we knew that kids needed those layers of belonging, those layers of your belonging to that large, you know, usually it's the largest is the BAMs and then the team and somewhat that advisory, but during the COVID time, that advisory became very tight and kids needed that belonging. Um, and kids and families were going through stress and it was important for um, us to have that, for kids to have an adult to go to, that we could refer them to the nurse, to the guidance counselor. Um, and that I think really helped for our focus. It really helped that we had that focus so we could be there for kids who were in need. Um, we really worked on this yellow cloud here, providing we wanted to, even though, because we knew we were still sending them across computers. So as much as possible, even though we were delivering our lessons across Zoom to another room, we were trying to have kids as much as possible work with paper, work with each other and get off the screen to you know, create those connections. Um, so we did group experiments in science class. Uh, you know, The science teachers across our building were great at finding ways to provision and use their materials. That was a big thing. You know, normally you're provisioning for 20 kids at a time and suddenly you have to provision for a whole team for that day. Um, Lots of classes did projects. We did lit circles. We were allowed to go outside. We were allowed to use the NPR in as many ways as possible. Get kids to interact with other kids outside of their pods in a COVID safe way. That was our goal. Get them off screens and get them interacting with as many other different peers as possible. Um, and that was about, you know, because there's only so many spaces um in our school and because we were stretched thin as far as coverage and you know needing spaces for lunch etc it, it you know it made it tough but we all worked together um silver linings for teachers in many ways this was some of the best pd and then the next slide is going to say uh, what parts were missing for or what parts were difficult for us um it was a great PD because like Tom was saying, we were in each other's classrooms. What an experience. I've taught for 19 years and have never been in as many classrooms as I have this year. Um, and so I put here, Nishaka's the master of pacing. It was great to see, you know, when you're picking it up and you're like, wow, that is what pacing is. Look at his momentum. He's going, he's going. Um, and you know, just being with Peggy Maxfield, she's our math teacher. And as I said, you know, um, I just saw firsthand as a student, I was also a student in her math class, helping facilitate with my kids and how she built my self-efficacy and theirs and how that just um, really led to me being so motivated um, and the kids being so motivated. So it was great to see, and, and lots of things. Elise Woodworth, our chorus teacher, uses some great technology. And um, as an older teacher, I was stealing that. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Um, and we were also able to see how students process our content differently. And that was really interesting to me. Um, and how we had to modify things and differentiate in a content area outside of the one we usually teach. So I had to make help kids in math um, when normally I'm teaching English. Ooh. And maybe I'm gonna move this down because that's all black. So some challenges for teachers, um, it's difficult to motivate students you do not see. So even when we were in person, we weren't seeing every kid in person. and 
also, I think you're, I think this is very true for Felix also that we'll present next. But I think this green kapow thing here, really to, I think myself and to many, that COVID clarified how crucial teachers are in helping kids succeed and do their work. Um, you know, I think we're seeing that now. Kids are struggling to get their work done and how much it makes a difference that they're face to face with that teacher who's saying, you can do it, I'm gonna help you. I'm not giving up, you are gonna do it. You're gonna be great. Um, and over here, I'm jumping over here to the blue, formative assessment. So that dip sticking, you know, I give you a task and I see, ooh, hold on, I hadn't anticipated four kids, six kids are having difficulty with this. And I'm quickly doing that diagnostic and saying, okay, what can I throw in here? How can I revise? That's that formative assessment that's really difficult during full in-person and if you're not, because we're zooming to room to room. So I'm just seeing the teachers here and I'm not seeing the kids. Um, so that, that, was, that was difficult. And I think the yellow, all this scaffolding and new platforms and avenues for learning and getting on board, it was an incredible increase in teacher workload. Um, I'm one of those teachers who, who works a, you know, many hours. It's my 19th year, but I worked harder this year as we all did, than I have ever, ever worked, including my first year teaching. There were many 14 hour days, many of us were there on the weekends. Um, and I guess I just want, you know, um, I just wanna let y'all know that, you know, that we were, you know, on board and uh, doing all we could, but it, you know, it took a lot of work. So, we have some student interviews. Should I click on that, Tom? It's up to you. Keith said he linked it. I also have it up on a tab on my computer if you would prefer that. Okay. Okay. So should I click on that now? Go for it. Play that or are we out of make time? Sure, make sure when you share it that you uh, click on the, add the audio. Yep, I'm gonna do a new share so that I can click on the sound. We have two students from Draco. And the first is Josiah, Josiah, sorry. And he's going to talk about what we just presented a little bit, challenges and the great stuff. Oh, Brindley's first, sorry. I definitely think focusing because when you're at home, you have like TVs, phones, stuff like that, that you'd rather be doing than schoolwork. And when you're at school, you're looking at a screen the whole time when you have friends and that you could be talking to or doing other things, which is hard to focus on the teacher talking. Well, in fifth and sixth grade, I was just about starting to use my Chromebook. And the fact that in the beginning of the school year, seventh grade, we used a lot of things on our Chromebooks. So it was really hard for me to learn how to do that. But throughout the year, it got better. But yeah, that was the hardest thing I had to do. Definitely seeing friends socializing because. I haven't really socialized over the whole COVID thing. And that was definitely a plus. Well, I can see a lot of kids saying this as well, that we hadn't been in school or really out with people for a long time. Uh, and just being, just zooming in our homes was really helpful and just transitioning to like full, full school is really helpful to do that. So I think that's hard, staying at home.
Um, I think it's the teachers understanding how hard it is to do this, but still pushing us to do it, giving us breaks. It's been really helpful. Helpful. Well, a, a lot of teachers really um, told kids to put up the energy and we played games. We also got recess, which is not normally in seventh grade. So that was really helpful just to get up the energy and the motivation for the school year. So that was really helpful. I love it. It's definitely made me socialize more because I wouldn't say that I was like socially awkward, but I would definitely say that I like was shy and like doing this, it helped me like know that I need to socialize, which made me have more friends and be open. Well, a lot of it was Zooming and a lot of it was just a lot of half of it was Zooming, half of it in school at the beginning. So it was pretty actually pretty difficult and I to um, make connections and try, still trying to make connections. So it didn't actually really help that much. So I think you know it didn't help that much at all. Having a little trouble navigating to the next slide, but oh, sorry. Um, so <laughs> there you go. The end. If there are any questions, uh, Tim, go ahead. Um, hi, this has been a wonderful presentation. I love these presentations. So thank you very much. It, uh, it also underscores what we said in the beginning in the proclamation, how important you are and how much we appreciate you. Um, but the uh, the Team Dragil, the identity unit, what a wonderful unit. What a wonderful opportunity for students to see who they are as unique products of a unique culture and how they view the world. My question is, um, maybe you've already doing this, but going forward, do you see those units as an opportunity to really focus on racial differences and the uh, the racial issues that are that have tearing have been tearing our our society apart? Um, I can say yes, absolutely, and I can say that um, for students of color, for students who identify as LGBTQ or non gender binary to have those students have the opportunity to, to the culminating experience in that identity unit was for students to create a Flipgrid video that was presented to the entire team where they actually talked about the different tenets of their identity to, to give everybody an understanding of who they are and where they're coming from in life. And I think it was really illuminating for all of our students to be able to hear from their peers that are that their, their peers that are students of color and their peers that identify in different ways that they do so that they could really identify specifics to their lives that are different than theirs. So yes, I would absolutely say that, that, that that's an effective way to address some of the things that you've just brought up. Great, thanks. Uh, Andy? Well, I, I, I wanna make sure I compliment the BAMS team for the presentation tonight. I think this was fantastic work. Uh, as a former middle level educator, I appreciate the, the work you do with I think some of our, our, uh, some of our most unique learners that we have. Um, within our district. I, I also want to compliment the work that you've done um, in really breaking down those silos between classes. I don't want it to go unnoticed that the, the teaching design that you chose this year, um, whereas teaching in middle, in middle level and especially second level is so deeply personal and often isolating, that you were in each other's classrooms, whether in person or in Zoom, is such an incredible feat. Uh, and I want to make sure that um, the, our, we all recognize the degree of vulnerability that you all shared in, in, in doing that. So uh, compliments to you, and I hope you can continue to leverage the great professional learning that you, that you took from this year with regards to that. 
Thank you, Andy. I just wanted to Thank say, you. I honestly thought that model might last a couple of weeks. And I told the staff that <laughs> they're laughing because I was like, there's no way that seventh and eighth graders are going to sit in the same room with 10, 10 all day long on Zoom. And they we managed uh, right before the April break, it got real tough. It was totally time to change, but we made it that long. And uh, I was so impressed. Um, I just don't want to forget we have a whole nother section of our presentation um, yes. with the remote team. No, we're not. We didn't forget. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing just so people don't feel. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? I don't normally wear headphones, but I have two dogs and two kids, and I don't know what's going on in my kitchen right now. I thought I'd be able to have dinner on the table, so um, bear with me. This is awkward to hear myself just echo. So um, I am Christy Henderson, and I am one of the teachers from the remote team. And um, if you don't know the remote team, we are Team Felix, and we made up the um, middle school remote team from um, all three schools. Um, I had the wonderful pleasure this year to work with colleagues that I haven't had the opportunity to work with um, in the building. I'm a Canis teacher. And um, so our staff is Chris Brewer, who teaches math. He is an AST teacher, typically in the building at BAMS. Myself, teaching science. Mandy Nash stepped up to teach ELA. She's also one of our AST teachers at BAMS. Joe Rivers, uh, social studies. And we could not thank these two enough. Um, our special educator, Marissa Ferruli, and Michelle Nelson, our academic support teacher. So basically, um, with the exception of Michelle, um, we got thrown into a, a room about a week before school started and had to create a team um, from the ground up. Everything from the schedule to um, classes, all of that stuff. And really at the heart of Felix, was the idea that all of us firmly embraced the idea that middle school is not a building. And we truly wanted to make sure that we gave these students the same experience, whether they were in the building or not. And that meant that we were gonna support them academically, socially and emotionally, and really, really try to continue to make relationships and connections the focus of being on Team Felix. So that brought us with um, 106 students first semester. Um, needless to say, I think many of us were ready to quit at several times, <laughs> but obviously we were in this together and then this in, the, in it for the students. Um, and we currently second semester, we sent some of those students back and then also acquired a few. So we're at 96 students, again, coming from both um, from BAMS, Putney and Dummerston. You might wonder, how did, why Team Felix? Um, well, at BAMS, the teams are constellation names and um, Dummerston are the Wildcats and Putney are the Panthers. Um, so that made us again, kind of look up back up to the skies and believe it or not, there actually is a cat Felix, a cat constellation, um, Felis. And so we tweaked that a little bit and named ourselves Team Felix um, to again, really try to bring this group of students um, from very different um, places um, together as one whole team. So some of the highlights of the remote program, um, which differed from like last spring when we all had to quickly um, learn how to be remote teachers. Uh, one of the things we felt was really important for um, not only students, but for our families was having a consistent schedule. Um, and um, again, to provide those connections, um, those social emotional connections. So every morning our students begin in an advisory, um, again, a small, a small group, um, attendance, check-in, you know, um, a five, four, three, two, one, how are you doing today? Um, just an opportunity again to um, check in and also make sure that they're ready to go for the day. Uh, students had two classes a day, um, seeing as that we had both seventh and eighth grade students um, and our numbers did not allow us for us to do any more than that. So our seventh grade students had their two classes in the morning and then their work time in the afternoon and our eighth grade students then had the opposite of that. Um, it did give kids each time a chunk of time to work and also to get support on assignments with our AST teacher. 
Then we also end our day with advisory. So again, an opportunity to check back in, you know, help them problem solve. What were your challenges? Um, were there assignments that you needed help on? Um, again, really to help start to develop students' um, executive functioning skills. Um, we uh, created small groupings, which um, definitely was a benefit of the remote program. Class sizes were between 11 and 13. Students, again, um, had Zoom. I, I was going to um, add up the number of hours that we were on Zoom, and I just, I had to stop. <laughs> um, so um, students Zoomed um, for two classes, but then for two advisories every day. Um, so need, needless to say, I think we're all um, about um, done with Zoom. And soon we will be, hopefully. Um, students um, are, when Michelle Nelson joined us, um, we then had an adult who was available every day um, to be able to provide support on assignments. Um, and then we used our Wednesday morning time to offer that as well um, to our students. Our program kind of um, changed again from first, first semester to second semester, just again, so we could best meet the needs of our students. Um, one of the additions that we added um, for second semester was to um, gather in team town meetings. So our seventh graders every two weeks have gotten together to see um, all of the other people on their team. Um, and then gives us an opportunity to have longer extended advisory times on Wednesdays on the opposite weeks. Um, again, just to further connect with activities and games. Also, um, we've stayed connected with schools and being a part of diversity week and spirit week. And that's been an important part of making sure that these students still feel connections to their um, home schools. So what did we kind of observe as successes from our remote students from Team Felix? Um, one of them definitely was their ability to branch out socially. Um, so again, um, Dummerson and Putney folks like the opportunity of being able to, again, see students that they will ultimately most likely be in high school with. Um, and so, um, and again, just that idea of being able to connect on Zoom and um, see people was important for our students. I think the accessibility was really, really important for students, and that um, happened in a lot of different ways. Um, in a classroom, sometimes you can hide, you can be quiet, um, you can still do that on Zoom, trust me. Um, but there was lots of different ways that we reached out to um, our remote students, giving full group instruction in Zooms, but really utilizing the breakout rooms. Um, and being able to put kids in smaller, even smaller groups so that we can do check-ins or even again, going all the way down to one-on-one -on -one, um, instruction with students. And students also got to really build on their communication and leadership skills. Um, again, especially around tech issues. Um, I'm not the best tech person. So I would say, hey, does anyone know how to do this? And I could just draw on students' expertise and send, um, send a student in a breakout with, with students to help them. Um, so again, it was just a really collaborative um, effort and continues to be so. Um, chat um, versus audio. So there are a lot of, there were students obviously that chose remote because of a lot of the social anxiety um, around learning and um, great that um, again, being able to have their camera off and just speaking was more comfortable or again, being able to use the chat. Um, so I think that there were lots of ways that students were able to find that comfort level for themselves so that they could really access their education. Because of having, um, depending on when their work time was, um, I don't know if Mr. If Joe will talk about this, but a really awesome pro project that Joe did in social studies was a lost and found project where kids acknowledged the things that they had lost because of the pandemic, but more importantly, to start to look at what all they have found because of this um, and to see students share that they've learned how to cook a souffle or a crepe. Um, and so there's a lot with baking and cooking, um, getting better at shooting um, free throws and things like that um, to again, um, doing learning how to draw by watching YouTube videos. So it's been neat for us to see that students have taken advantage um, of their other learning time to really explore who they are and learn new skills. And the last piece, partly out of necessity, but also hopefully because of the structures that we had to put in place, um, definitely saw students improve and their executive functioning skills, being able to manage their time, organize, being more self-directed, keeping track of their assignments, um, all of those important things that will benefit them um, when they return um, to the classroom. Teacher successes. <laughs> um, definitely. I know um, 
for me, I think for all of us, we talk quite often. Um, we actually meet every day on Zoom. Um, it's supposed to only be a half an hour, but it usually spills over because again, it's you can feel really isolated as a remote teacher and um, it's great. So we made that commitment to each other to make sure that we would meet every day. We check in about students. Um, we talk about our curriculum and what's happening in our classrooms. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that this group wanted to do that on a regular basis because that definitely is hard not to be in the building and be able to go into someone's room. Um, and again, just to laugh sometimes um, and support each other um, has really been an important part of this journey. If I was at BAMS, I would only actually end up really getting to know a quarter of my students because that would be one out of the four teams. Um, I'd still probably get to know the other grade in the hallways and stuff. And so um, we all have definitely felt like it's been great um, to be able to um, meet so many more students. And again, connection to the, out, um, the outlying schools. So next year I'll be a seventh grade teacher. So all of the students that I will have will be totally new to me, but I'm so excited that I'll be able to walk through the halls and see so many kids that I had this year. Um, and so again, I think that just, again, breaks down those walls and just creates better community. A lot more one-on-one -on -one time with students. So even though we had 96 kids, um, especially in our advisory settings, um, morning and afternoon, you're easily able to connect more one-on-one -on -one with students. And again, just in breakout rooms, you could just meet one-on-one -on -one with a student just to check in about ac academics and just in general. Um, as I said, two of our teachers, um, Chris Brewer and Mandy Nash, were our, our AST teachers at BAMS, and they both stepped into um, a core role on the, on the remote team. And so um, they've just gotten such like exposure to the curriculum that will help them when they return to the building, um, when they're back to supporting students. So they spoke very highly of that being a really important part that they're going to be able to take back to their classroom. Um, as a Really important piece, our structure of meeting every day has allowed us um, to meet daily with our academic support teacher and our special educator. Um, so every day we were talking about, this is what I'm doing. Can you help you know, reinforce this in your skills block? Um, and that communication has been key to helping so many of our students um, really be successful. Um, and I really think a lot of students, um, there's really struggled inside the classroom um, for a variety of issues. And um, they have seen such great success with being um, on Team Felix. And I think that this is really a really important part that's enabled that to happen. And um, more opportunities to differentiate and modify assignments. I know for me as a science teacher, um, it's important. Um, I don't always get that chance like in the classroom it's a lot harder to give different assignments to students because it's kind of all out there um, but in the remote setting um, typically I'd have two or three different versions and kids wouldn't know which one they got <laughs> um, and it would just be pushed out to them and then I can meet with them in breakout rooms um, so I definitely feel like um, I became much better at being able to different, differentiate and scaffold my assignments which ultimately then um, enabled kids to better access that as well as being able to offer a lot more different ways to be able to assess student understanding through different projects um, and products. There's definitely been some challenges, <laughs> too many to fit on a slide sometimes, and I don't really want, I want to focus on that, but I think, you know, one thing that we need to all think about and as these students that have been remote for a year go back next year um, as a district, um, again, looking at these pieces that um, our students continued to only get two classes per week um, for um, the whole year. So again, being mindful of that as we are thinking about um, next year with our curriculum and helping students, again, identifying where, where they're at and helping them move forward. Um, unfortunately, with the state of Vermont, um, attending advisory was the minimum requirement for attendance for the day. So we would have students who would log on and say, I'm here for um, attendance and then would not um, engage in their classes. So um, that was challenging and, and kind of as part of that, um, again, not seeing and hearing from students from Zoom. Um, again, some for some of them, it was poor internet connection. So, you know, why I might have had a great activity and it been a group activity, a lot of times on the fly, we would have to uh, modify that because students literally just couldn't be um, participate with their audio or video. Um, and then unfortunately, we do have um, a group of students who just, um, again, uh, were not able to engage with us, no matter what we tried to do with them. And I think um, 
Um, last Wednesday, so this is only a small part of, of um, Team Felix, but last Wednesday, um, we invited BAM students back in the building um, uh, just to, again, see what it's like to be in a, in a building again, to wear a mask. Um, and we start tomorrow with SBAC, but we really felt it was important to have them come back and just meet us in person, meet each other in person, and do some kind of team building and um, group games um, just to start to kind of make that feel a little bit normal for them. Um, and they are all coming back tomorrow um, to um, give us their best shot here on the SBAC. And then um, in, between, in between that, we will be continuing to do activities again um, to help um, celebrate, celebrate what, they've, what they've done this year, um, which has really been phenomenal. And I, um, Joe, do you have anything to add about Team Felix? I, I guess what I would like to add is something that you've already mentioned, Christy, and I, I'd like to just emphasize it because it goes to what uh, the superintendent was speaking about before. And that was, what did we gain from this experience? And for us, one thing that we felt like we gained was that uh, opportunity to work daily with the staff that was supporting the students. And so academic support teacher and the special, ed special educator were meeting with us on a daily basis. And so we could talk not just about what was going on in our classes, but we could talk about what was going on with our students and we could share what was happening in, in our environments together in order to be able to troubleshoot and problem solve for individuals. In um, the old program <laughs> at BAMS, it, it's more siloed with special education working pretty much on their own and academic support working on their own and math, social studies, science, and English working on their own together in a team environment. And uh, we were able to support students in a way that uh, we've got a lot of good feedback from parents of, of students who have traditionally struggled in school. And uh, the feedback was that their children were feeling more success. And that success was because we were able to uh, troubleshoot and problem solve real time issues for the students uh, with the support of, with the academic support and with special education working in concert uh, on a daily basis. And boy, I'd like to be able to keep doing that. And I think it's time, uh, it might be past time, <laughs> but, but I think it's time for uh, me and Jay. Jay, you wanna unmute yourself? You've been hanging in there for a long time. Say hello, Jay. Hello. You might need to turn off your camera, Jay, in order to, and try again with your unmuting. Try again. Hello, everybody. Jay. So that's Jay Terrell, and uh, Jay and I are going to, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here, and we're going to talk a bit about a program that we've been doing at uh, BAMS for about six years, and it's, uh, well, we'll just talk about it and um, explain it as the slides unfold, I hope. So. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, BAM started working in concert with the Brattleboro Historical Society in order to do projects with students that were place-based and uh, about local history. And then uh, around six years ago, uh, there was a WKVT had a radio program in the morning called Green Mountain Mornings that Chris Lenoir operated. And he contacted the Historical Society and asked if they would um, create a weekly radio segment that could be played about local history. And the uh, Historical Society, made of people mostly my age or older, uh, didn't know how to work that kind of technology. And so they came to the middle school and asked students if they would um, help with this. And so about six years ago, uh, Brattleboro Area Middle School students began 
a, a weekly radio broadcast uh, recording that uh, started on WKVT in Green Mountain Mornings uh, storyline. And then when uh, Green Mountain Mornings went away, the radio show uh, transferred to WTSA and plays there uh, every Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. And so you can hear BAM students in this year because of uh, Team Felix. We also have students from Putney and Dummerston participating in this uh, weekly radio show. Uh, we started then uh, cataloging and archiving those uh, broadcasts. And so we have a SoundCloud channel and you can see that on this slide. And uh, those podcasts are stored at the SoundCloud channel called Brat Historical SOC. And about two years ago, we began taking the uh, scripts that went with the radio shows and turning those into longer form articles for the Weekend Reformer. And so students for the last few years have been working uh, by research and then writing to help create these uh, weekly newspaper articles. You might, if you read the Reformer on the weekends, you'll see these in, uh, in there. Uh, again, we started working with the Historical Society about 10 years ago. Uh, the idea is that uh, knowing about what came before helps us understand who we are and who we might want to become. And for middle school students, that's certainly part of their journey, especially in those middle school years. Students are trying to establish not just who they are as individuals, but where they fit in the bigger picture. And so if we can give them a grounding with uh, their community, in a sense of what happened before in their community and where they may fit in their community, uh, that gives them a foundation that helps them grow into the high school years, or that's our belief. So uh, that's a picture of some middle school. We go on uh, annual field trips, walks around town, local history visitations, and the, uh, that's actually the old high school, you're probably aware, and now is the municipal center. And on the third floor is the Historical Society, and that's part of our uh, tour of the town. We've been recording in different ways over the years uh, with, our, uh, with our students, and you can see how it's changed. Uh, we started with the uh, white mic and a few students reading scripts and editing, and then went to a, a bigger platform and uh, the picture up in the top right hand corner is when we were still at WKVT and students would go in and do the morning show periodically. And now because of our remote status, we're using the online voice recorder and students are recording at home and then sharing their recordings and we're splicing those together in order to continue the practice. Uh, so far, there have been about 304 podcasts and 126 articles, all again about Brattleboro area history. And uh, we try to be diverse in our approach. And so you can see some of the topics that we have listed over the years. And uh, it's not just research, but it's also interviews. And students have, uh, again, because of this COVID situation this year, we haven't really been doing interviews, but that will typically be a part of it and we hope to bring it back uh, in the future. And Jay, uh, I think it's your turn. Hello, I am Jay. And so on the slide, we can see baby boomers and generation Z. My generation is Generation Z. And so the Historical Society um, put out on Facebook a thing where we learn about growing up in Barbara, Guilford, Dumberton, Vernon, Putney, and Dover. Well, it was like through kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade or twelfth schools and so B 
he got the hand back. And so depending on school we were with you, we focused on that, those responses. And so once we took those responses, we compared them to our lives growing up. And so once we are done comparing our lives from the boomers' lives, we um, read an article for the Historical Society and made a podcast about baby boomers growing up and generation C. I'm just going to give you a little break here and um, let your internet cool down again. Sounds like it's going to break up a bit. Uh, the picture that you see here is uh, group of students. It's a group of students from the middle school uh, academy in the 19, early 1950s. And Jay, do you want to talk about this slide at all? I think Jay's having internet problems, which is part of Team Felix and uh, the Zoom environment. So uh, I'm going to try to cover for him a little bit here. Uh, this next slide shows the Green Street School yeah. when it was being designed, and uh, then the Academy School. Uh, I know you're. Today, we were voting on uh, whether the academy school would uh, add an addition, but this was the academy school uh, before <laughs> the academy school that was built in the 1950s. And so we did end up producing three articles and three podcasts, and these were our topics. Jay was just speaking about them, uh, one and two room schoolhouses, what life was like then growing up in the 50s and 60s. And then the, the part I think that the students enjoyed the most was comparing young people's lives today with that of the baby boomers. So those were some of the things we did in the past. I'm pressing the button here, trying to advance the slide. I'm going the wrong way. Well, there are a few more slides, but my uh, screen's not moving them. So I'm gonna stop sharing. There are a few more things that we wanted to um, talk about. One of them was that uh, we have been working with the uh, Words Project, the Brattleboro Words Project and Trail. You may have heard of that organization. It's uh, been ex in existence for about five years. It was uh, funded by the National Endowment for Humanities, uh, Brooks Memorial Library, Marlboro College, the Literary Festival, and uh, Right Action and the Historical Society together, put together um, a trail of history stories that you can now download an app. If you go to the Brattleboro Words Project, you can get an app to put on your phone and you can travel around town with the map that's provided on the app. And you can hear over a hundred historical stories of the places in our community. About 20% of them uh, feature BAM students who uh, did the recordings over the last six years. And so uh, we're pleased to have been uh, a contributor to that program. And uh, a few other programs that we're doing, a uh, few other projects. We've been working with uh, Peter Elwell and the uh, town committee uh, in relation to the uh, Civil War Monument at the common and the uh, inaccurate information that's on that. Uh, we have students who were in BAMS and who are now in the high school who are continuing with that committee work, uh, hoping to uh, bring some, uh, some new information to the monument at the, uh, at the common and to share the story of more of us than what is presently shared on that monument. Another project that Jay is working on with Maeve Bald, who wasn't able to be here tonight, and a few other students from the 
present team Felix. We're working with Steve, Ro uh, um, Steve Barrett and the uh, Public Works Department to help create a sign at the uh, Chestnut Hill Reservoir uh, because of all the new work that's been done up there uh, in order to bring back the reservoir. And uh, our students have done the research in order to create a sign that visitors to that area will be able to then understand uh, how that reservoir came to be, the Highland Park that was located there, and uh, some of the other activities that happened in the area. So uh, we're pleased to be able to link with the Historical Society and to try to make uh, real world contributions to the community uh, while students are learning how to read, research, uh, listen, speak, interview, and uh, bring those things uh, to our students in a meaningful way where they feel like they're contributing. And thanks for listening, because this has been a long one. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Are there any questions or, or comments on all these things that we've heard from uh, Liz, Tom, Joe, Christy, and, and Jay? Andy? Well, again, I want to reiterate my compliments to the to Team Felix. Uh, the, the learning and the growth that you've achieved this year is tremendous. Um, thank you for bringing Jay out. Jay, I wish we, we could hear, hear more of you today because um, you had some great things to say. So nicely done. I know it's hard to come onto a board meeting and speak um, and you did a nice job with that. So compliments to you and to the full team. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I've got a Murphy and I don't know whether it's Sean or Emily, so I'm just gonna, it's Sean, okay. Go ahead, Sean. Muted. I think you muted, Sean. Uh, sorry, uh, that was a great presentation about BAMS. Um, and I loved hearing the history of the Historical Society uh, piece in every Saturday's paper. Uh, I look forward to reading it every Saturday and I've learned so much. And to hear the context um, of how the students are participated in that uh, really validates uh, what a wonderful job is doing. And, that, and that's the last presentation, but I would go back to all the previous presentations by all the staff. Um, it, it was, you know, it really is heartening. I did have kind of a question. Maybe this is for Keith. Um, I was just wondering how a unified district, a five town single district, uh, and especially uh, in the remote section that was referred to in that middle schoolers in, in all five towns got to participate to some degree, especially for the remote. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any comment about um, the advantages uh, that have been come to fruition because we are a unified district of five, four towns. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, certainly being able to bring the Putney and Dummerston students on board was, was a big deal. I, I think Putney and Dummerston couldn't have done it without, um, you know, we couldn't have done it as, as a SU. I, I, we didn't have the staff to figure it out. And, and um, so, um, you know, it was a great collaboration to have the middle schoolers from those two towns join our um, staff and kids. And so they've made connections across the board. So there's great benefits there. Um, <clears throat> It certainly led to a lot of conversations about aligning curriculum and and conversations um, with Team Felix and some of the you know I'm sure they haven't had a lot of time to talk with the Putney and Doverston teachers but but it does um, raise some of those um, conversations um, either now or in the future um, you know uh, I don't know if that was what you were getting at with your question Sean. Um, probably the teachers can answer some of the benefits of working with the Dumberston Putney kids more than I can, but we, we've also taken up a lot of time. So I, you know, I don't know. Um, Thanks, Keith. Yeah. Uh, just one clarification. We're not actually done. We still have Putney and uh, Academy School next week. 
So we, we, we're, we're, not, we're not finished yet. Uh, Julianne. Hi, yes. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry, I have, um, like Christy, I have a dog in the background, so <laughs> I'm just going to talk. Um, so yes, I loved hearing the presentation. And um, just to kind of um, build on what um, Sean was asking about and Keith was commenting on, I just wanted to say that um, it's, it was really incredible this year to have the Dummerson School students who were fully remote be folded into um, Team Felix. And, um, you know, just really, those students were part of Team Felix. Like they were brought on board. Um, the, you know, the teachers um, saw them as their own. And, you know, our school still supported those students, you know, with our school counseling and, you um, they had some, you know, access to our exploratory program, um, but the the band's staff really, um, really integrated those students, like really brought them into the fold, which was so wonderful and so important. And the students were so excited to know that, you know, to get to know the teachers, to meet other students from um, the other schools. Uh, and so that was just, um, it's just really remarkable because because like Keith said, we couldn't have done it on our own, you know, at this um, at the quality, you know, with this level of quality. Uh, and so I just want to highlight that. And that was also true for the, um, you know, the other the K to six remote program as well. Right. We, we had a collaboration there, too, um, with um, Green Street and Oak Grove. So uh, that piece I wanted to, to highlight as as just um, really invaluable this year and it's been nice to to kind of work with other teachers and um have other teachers you know from, from BAMS know summer school students now you know and kind of have that like we have that shared experience a, a little bit that we have these students that they've taught um and that's happened to me too in the k-6 to level where you know there's there's teachers now who um, no Dummerson school community in a different way and i really enjoyed that opportunity so thank you Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Well, that was terrific. Thank you, Keith, Liz, Tom, Christy, uh, Joe, and Jay for the for the effort and the information. It's um, it's just, it's an incredible gift for, uh, for to be able to to have a look into the fabric of what actually goes on in the schools. Since obviously we can't be in there. And um, even for parents, you, you hear parts of it, but to, to hear the breadth of the activities and the quality of the things that you came up with and the focuses, focusing so intensely on the students. And um, I'm just, it's just, it's wonderful. And uh, thank you for, for sharing all that. Let me ask one more time if there are any other questions or, or comments. I uh, see none, we'll move into our, um, business uh, for the evening. Uh, just let me check with Andy because I jumped to the uh, BAMS presentation, which is under the administrative report. So I want to make sure, Andy, if there's anything else you needed to add or wanted to share um, that, you, um, that we make time for that. No, I think, I think Keith and the team from BAMS covered everything that we need to hear about student learning tonight. So great. We'll be content to let it rest. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, I need a motion then. We're gonna move to the consent agenda and um, we uh, changed the consent agenda, uh, added the uh, announcement of resignations, the approval of resignations and retirements and new hires to the uh, consent agenda. And um, we had three late additions. So we're gonna uh, go ahead and approve them uh, tonight. And um, so that they can be hired, and hope that the um, I didn't look into this to make sure that we can actually approve things that weren't that uh, weren't notified uh, 48 hours in advance. But I have a feeling that we can. I, I, I don't think that uh, open meeting law can um, preclude our our statutory authority to hire people. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and we'll add the names of Alex DeRosia. A uh, uh, new teacher at grade three at Green Street, uh, Krista Casolino at Green Street as well, grade five, and Christy Jackson, who's going to be joining BAMS to, as an English teacher. So uh, 
I need a motion for the consent agenda, the uh, minutes of April 27th, 2021, the warrants of April 5th, April 12th, uh, April 19th, April 26th, and May 3rd, and payrolls for April 12th and April 23rd, as well as resignations, retirements, and new hires as listed. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? So moved. So moved. Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Liz, was that your second? Yeah. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Liz to accept the consent agenda. Any questions or comments? Uh, Tim, you're unmuted. Does that mean you want to talk? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> you jumped to, when someone unmutes, they go right to the top of my list. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, no questions. I would uh, ask all those in favor of approving the consent agenda to indicate by unmuting and saying aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? The consent agenda is adopted. Um, next is public comment for non agenda items. We moved this up after or before, before administrative reports and after consent agenda. So we could get a sense if there were a lot of people, we would have a, we would extend it at the end of the meeting. Um, if not, uh, or if there were short comments that could be done in ten minutes, we would have it at the an earlier time in the meeting. So if there is anyone who has a public comment and not agenda items, this would be the time to make the comment. Uh, I want to remind people that. Uh, as a non-agenda item, no one has had time to uh, look into any questions that may arise or um, g gather any information. So it's very likely that a, a question would not necessarily get a response. So um, at, rate, at any rate, any, any uh, comments on non-agenda items from the public? Seeing none, we will move to the... Um, uh, fiscal report is listed, but I, I'm not aware that we have a fiscal report. Frank, I just want to check. Um, is there? Do you have anything you needed to share? I believe Frank may have stepped away from the microphone and, and camera, but I we spoke earlier. He didn't really have anything to share. Right, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think so. Great, thank you. Um, so, committee reports. Uh, first, leadership councils. Um, Ruby McAdoo submitted a report from the Putney one online. She wasn't able to attend tonight, so, uh, but you you all have that in your inbox. Um, any other uh, reports from leadership councils? David, I don't have a report, um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to share that the BAMS leadership council and a bunch of parents put in gardens um, over the weekend. They're uh, pretty amazing. Uh, I share just a couple of quick pictures. Yeah. Really great. quickly. Uh, hopefully. Right, <laughs> yeah. Can you see that? Not yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so this is the uh, uh, center um, front entryway. The, to the right is a bus loop. To the left is a student drop off. And you can see where we started there. And I'll just flip through. Oh, I meant to be able to flip through here. Uh, some, some of the photos, so we had, uh, this was Saturday morning of a group of volunteers. We had uh, compost donated, uh, I think that was by the Wyndham Solid Waste. And we built, um, um, let's see, Amit Sharma uh, secured a bunch of lumber from, uh, oh geez, I'm spacing it, the folks in Guilford who have the, the lumber mill. Uh uh, yeah, Clint. Um, Gerber? Gerber? Yeah, Gerber? Gerber, yes. Uh, yes. And um, I don't have all the names of everyone here. I didn't prepare that, but I just thought I'd share these photos really quick. Um, so he built these boxes. Uh, uh, Elise Wadsworth and Jessica Montanieri are two teachers who were really kind of organizing along with Amit, some of the parents. And so we got them all built and planted and a lot of kale and Amit's young um, child there was playing with the hose and having a good time. And uh, so, yeah, I just want to share those. They look great when you come into the school. It'll look better in a few weeks. Yes. Thanks, Keith. Uh, let's see, other uh, leadership councils? 
Okay, um, then we'll move to committee reports. Oh, Michelle. Hi, um, I, I, I'm not sure if anyone from Demerson is here to do the leadership council report. Um, that, that was something that they've been trying to implement. Um, we did meet last week. The majority of the meeting um, was spent organizing and getting updated on, uh, uh, their, we're building a new playground and it's a really big deal. And um, we have a planning committee and we've hired a designer and just a ton of heart and thought is going into the landscape of our school and what we could build on over years to come. And so uh, we met with that designer and that was a major part of the update. We were also just um, reorganizing, um, excited that the school district as a whole is intending to do that. We have Carmen Winchester, I think I said at the last meeting as our new chair. Um, and then I had to leave because it was the same night as the budget meeting. So I don't know if Julianne Egan is here and if there's anything else to share, but I just wanted to speak up and share, share what I was there for. <laughs> Yeah, I think you covered it, Michelle, because we spent, we had to spend, we had um, um, Adam Hubbard visiting, so we had to spend a lot of time on that, and then um, that took up most of our meeting time, so yeah, sorry about the dog. <laughs> Any others? Um, no committee reports? I think that, um, oh, Anne, that's right, we had a policy committee meeting. Yes, we did have a policy committee meeting on Friday the 7th. Um, we approved two policies to pass along to the rest of the board. Uh, policy E13, which is access control, um, which basically states that Andy has control over who has access to the buildings. And uh, policy C6, which is a board superintendent relationship. Um, we discussed neither of those two were ready, I guess, for this evening because they aren't on this evening's agenda. And then we've begun a discussion of the application of our ongoing commitment to social justice in policy. And I think that about covers it. Yeah, we um, we met on Friday, so there wasn't time to warn those policies, Anne. That's why they, they didn't show up tonight. That's what I thought. Great. And I know PPEC meets next week i believe any other uh committees tim um just a couple of things from oak grove the uh the parents here would really like to know um if at all possible what the schedule is going to be like for the remaining weeks if it's going to be um all in person or just uh the more information they can get the better for them of course and then um oak grove i brought this up before has a tremendous uh, project being led by Tara Davis on the living schoolyard. And she's collaborating with uh, a lot of people. Uh, Michelle, I wonder if uh, the designer, was that uh, Tara Gordon? Um, because Tara Davis is working with uh, Tara Gordon and, and we're looking into the uh, Rich Earth Institute and looking into a lot of uh, interesting initiatives led by Tara Davis. Um, the other thing that uh, we discussed was uh, th there's still a need to distinguish the difference between a PTO and a learning uh, a leadership council. And our next leadership council, uh, Mary was going to uh, look into Green Street's model and see if we can invite somebody from Green Street, Green Street's leadership council to attend the leadership council at Oak Grove. But they're doing, we're doing all we can to, um, to increase participation on that LC. So that's all. Thanks, Tim. Any other um, comments on leadership or reports on leadership councils or committees? Well, I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda. So, um, so Anne, I believe you're you're up, Mr. Chair. There being no further business before this board, I move that we adjourn. Is there a I'll second? Second that. I'll second that. Thank you, Liz. 
Uh, moved and seconded that we adjourn. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by unmuting and saying aye. 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 I heard a child agreed as well. <laughs> uh, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and especially the folks from BAMS for that wonderful presentation. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night, Wendy. Night. Night.